And let's give a loving hand and a telling hand where we can. Amen. Amen. We are still dealing with the road to revival this morning. Yes, amen. amen. And we're going to do so for some time. Um, this morning we're going to read from Philippians 3 and also from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I'm entitling it this morning, Reaching Forward. We are not forgetting here ever that we will be dealing with comparisons with types and shadows. Uh, and we are not forgetting that the Lord said very clearly that we are not to run after signs and wonders. Okay. And also that He will come for a victorious church. And in addition to that, that the Lord would like us to change our belief system. And when I said that, I made it clear at a previous occasion that by belief system, we're not referring to doctrine yet. All right. Uh, as Paul correctly said while sharing over communion this morning, believing is one thing. The Word of God, in fact, declares that you believe and do well, or you believe in God and do well, but the demons also believe and tremble. So believing that there's a God is not good enough. And if we want to know something this morning, we've got to have a look at revival, we've got to understand that when we speak about revival, we're talking about reviving something that either is dead or that is busy dying. And in the day and age we're living in and we're looking at the church, there is so much that has happened, there is so much that has been learned, there is so much revelation that has come through the church of Christ throughout the last 20, 30 years and through the ages. Um, and with modern technology, we have so much at, at our exposure in terms of Bibles and, and, and dictionaries and concordances and DVDs and videos and stuff. And at the end of the day, the sad thing is that the false is crept in as well. Now, technology to me is a great thing, and I just love all the things that are available to us today. But the sad thing about it is that although we are able to reach millions of people very easily today, I mean, there are men today that only do television broadcasts as a ministry. Yeah. And so he sits in his lounge and he ministers from there and he reaches tens of thousands of people all over the world through that media. And this is great, this is excellent if we can use it to God's glory. But at the same time, it has opened the door for the evil one to come in and deceive the body of Christ. And so there's a lot of stuff that being preached and taught out there that are just so far from the real truth that it is scary. And so we're at a, at a time now, and we've got to also bear in mind at the same time, if we're talking revival, that there's two confusing issues that we mustn't get wrong here. And as I said, we're talking about reviving something that's busy dying. So we're going to revive the church, which is setting into some state of apathy. All right? This is what needs to be done. Now many people have this this perception of revival has been something where all, all these thousands are flocking into the church and people are healed and risen out of wheelchairs and, and, and etc. etc. Now that is partially true. That happens. Because when God really starts stirring up His people and moving among His people, the gifts begin to flow, the faith rises up, people get zealous for God and go out and reach the lost. So it is partially true, but it's not the whole truth. The whole truth is that revival is going to start within my heart and within your heart. It's that belief system that needs to be changed. The other thing you've got to steer away very clearly of is that there's this false teaching. And that a lot of people do it quite innocently. And that is, in the last days, the Lord will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. And so there are some preachers and there are some teachers uh, that are teaching today that we're going to wait for the last days in which that event will take place. Now we've got to make it very clear that all flesh does not mean that God is going to pour out His Spirit upon Satan worshippers. The word all flesh literally just meant all nations. It meant it included the Gentiles. It meant no longer just Israel. And if you go to the Word of God and you will find in Acts when Peter brings his great sermon, he says, this is that day that the prophet wrote about. So it took, it took place right there at the day of Pentecost. It's not some future event. So we're, some people are standing and waiting for something to happen like that. It's not going to happen. It's happening. Okay. All right. 
So we mustn't get confused. This morning, we have also got to understand something else, and that it is our responsibility. God has said everything available to us, it all depends on to the level, the degree that we want to submit. Resist, learn, know, practice, live. It's all up to us. God is not a respecter of persons. So I'm not special in his sight. I am very special in his sight. But I'm not more special than anybody else sitting up before me. And there's no American preacher that's more special than I. Alright? So it all depends on the degree that we want to commit. The degree we want to believe. The degree we want to live out what we know. And that is why we are having these titles that God has given me. And I know you've forgotten most, but we did go forward and uh, we were standing and, and moving and not standing. Yes. We spoke about having fresh bread daily. All right. We spoke about not looking back. These are vital issues. And now this morning I'm going to talk to you about reaching forward, which links very much with not looking back. Reaching forward. And the greatest mistake people make is that we're so caught up and the devil catches us. He trips us up between yesterday and tomorrow. And that makes me worthless right now. It's either past successes or past failures that I want to sit and ponder on. A past failure normally brings a fear into my life, so I'm scared to do A past success is, oh yeah, the good old days, you know, and I get caught up in false nostalgia. And then I'm worthless today. Or else, one day, if someday, when the that ship comes down the cow here, and I'm going to have all that money, then I can do something. One day when I finish settling my business, or when God provides three million rand, I can start preaching the gospel or working for God. One day, and right now, I'm sitting with us, and it catches us between yesterday and tomorrow. All right? I have life right now. I mix with people right now. A good friend of mine once moved down and he said to me, I've got this one problem, and that's ministry. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I mean, if I leave now, what about ministry? I said, brother, are there people there? Yes. Are you, are you taking your Bible with them? Yes. Well, then you've got people, you've got a Bible, you've got the Spirit of God, you've got a ministry. Amen. There are times in our lives that God will probably say, go there. And a very clear and, 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 and definite way, I will understand that. But most of the time, God is not really concerned about whether you live in Walkness or Port Alfred or Timbuktu. Choice is really yours. He's given you freedom of choice. But wherever you go, He expects you to serve Him. Yes. Turn to Philippians 3, verses 12 to 16. You with me, Listen to what Paul is saying, and I want us to carefully and rightly divide the word here. He says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected. So although, Paul says, he and we are not perfect, we do what? We press on. Many people come to me and say, you know, I want to work for God. Now, you know, I still have this sin and this weakness and this doubt and this fear. And I'm saying, if you're going to wait for that to get right, mate, you're never going to get into ministry. You're never going to do anything for God. All right? He says, we have not become perfect, we have not attained, we have not accomplished, yet we impress on. Okay? Our imperfections, our shortcomings, our weaknesses, our past failures must not be doubted upon. Alright? We must not even be given thought. They're gone. The past is past. You cannot change the past. We must press on. Lord knows how many mistakes I've made in my life. The Lord knows how many mistakes I still make. If I'm going to sit and ponder on those mistakes, I'll be worthless to anybody. I'm going to look and say, Steve, wrong. Steve, mistake. Definitely, so let's carry on. Let's go on. Let's press forward. Let's do it again. And we've got to learn this lesson because this works in marriage. This works in business. This works in ministry. This works in sport. This works in whatever you do. If you're going to sit and get stuck because you failed, you've lost. Forget the failure and press on. Hear what he says. Continue in the same verse now. That we may lay hold of that for which or for which purpose 
Christ has also laid hold of us. You did not get saved just to get saved. The Lord laid hold of you with a purpose. And I, understand, I don't understand why we have this problem of thinking that purpose is to come and clean this, the church pew on a Sunday with my bum. God has a special purpose for every individual that He laid hold of. And we've got to get hold of what that purpose is and press on toward it. See what God has for you. Okay? We've got to make that decision. We've got to say, I want to lay hold of why He laid hold of me. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you get recruited into the military, they recruit you with a purpose. So they lay hold of you and you've got to lay hold of the reason why they lay hold of you. When I get employed, they employ me with a purpose in a job situation. And I'm going to determine, why did you employ me? Not because my wife, I mean my wife's way at home. Not because I'm such a handsome guy. You saw something. You had a reason. You want me to sell? You want me to bolt? You want me to break? You want me to paint? That's why I'm employed. And unless I know why I'm employed, I can't do what I'm supposed to be doing. Now we've got to understand that God or Christ Jesus lay hold of you and I with a purpose. And we've got to find out what that purpose is, forget the past failures, and strive towards it. That's what he's trying to tell us here. Now in verse 13, he says, I do not count myself to have apprehended. So Paul says, I'm not quite apprehended, I've quite, not quite laid hold of. I'm not quite grasped or understood all things. Yet. One thing we must do, and then one thing is, forget those things that are behind us, our past, the good and the bad, and reach forward to the things that are ahead of us. Reach forward to the things that are ahead. And please, let the Spirit of God speak to your heart this morning. I know in my heart of hearts there are people here that have been stuck with that thing. There are people here that have stood themselves blind in their failures and their shortcomings. It's history. God has forgiven, God has forgotten. Don't you dare raise yourself higher than me. Reach forward. Okay? The one thing we must not do, we must do, and that is forget what is behind and reach forward to the things which are ahead. We've got to do that. Verse 14, we must press toward the goal, and that goal being the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That is the end goal. That is the prize. Okay? We have entered a race, and that race is not a hundred meter sprint. It's a great big long marathon. But there's a prize awaiting. And unless we get that goal within really sight, unless we understand why we're here and why we're, we've been laid hold of, why we've been employed, why we've been brought into the kingdom, why we're part of the family, adopted into the family, with a purpose. You've got to strive for your crown. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going back to Philippians 3 later, but just let's turn to 1 Corinthians 9. We have to strive for our crown. You're not just going to get it. Christians are going to get off this, I'm on the glory train to heaven. I'm sitting in a rocking chair. You've got to strive for a crown. Ministry is spelled W-O-R-K for those who have not noticed. You know, I've been, I've been looking at these guys, and, and, and sorry, I've got two of them sitting in front of me, these people that are busy qualifying for pastorship. And, these. and I often talk to them out there, and the other little young chaps that are pastors, and they're full of zeal, and they get out there, and they're all excited because I'm going to preach, and I'm going to shake the movement and get the people saved and delivered and all sorts of stuff. And, and then with a shock, they wake up six months later and think, that's an hour on a Sunday. Unless you're going to board off, but this is going to be off now. 
But, uh, <laughs> all right. That's an hour of glory, of great, of nice, of, of sharing the knowledge on a Sunday. From Monday to Saturday, it's hard slogging. It's accounting, and it's admin, and it's gripes and complaints about ingrained toenails and all sorts of stuff. It's hard work the rest of the week. So if you get into ministry to preach, forget it. The preaching is just, that's the fun bit. You go in, in 1 Corinthians, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Obtain what? Obtain that prize. Remember we just now said the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So run in a way that you obtain that prize. Verse 25. That everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Do we know what temperance is? You're temperate in all things. In other words, they exercise self-control in all things. All right, hold your finger there. We're not moving on in that scripture. To be temperate means that you don't do anything excessively. No? All right. If you look at an athlete, he watches his diet. He watches his sleep. Okay. Now this may come shocking coming from a, a pulpit or a minister, but do you know that professional football players are even by their trainers told to watch their sexual life. They have to abstain because it saps energy at times. You can't play an important game and, and be with your wife tonight. You're going to come and sleep at the clubhouse or the hotel. We need that energy. So everything is done in temperance to get the body tuned in perfect for the task at hand. You can't eat excessively, you can't drink excessively. You may have to say no to the chocolates and eat whatever else is required by your dietitian to get your body in shape. And to get my body in shape and your body in shape, maybe two different diets. You can't do exercise as well. It's going to be temperate exercise. You can't over-exercise strength-wise or stamina-wise. You may have to eat whatever. But it's temperance. All right. So what is he saying? And now that now they do obtain a perishable crown, these people. They're doing all this to obtain a perishable crown. In other words, they do it for worldly wealth, worldly accomplishments, worldly glory. Okay. And they go through this temperance, this life of temperance. Go and look at some sport people. You know, we look at sport people, and and we often think, wow. Tell it to this. If you see the lives these people live, look at professional tennis players that travel the world. And look at these young people. They don't have a life that you young people may have. When other young people are going out and partying, they can't. There's a price to pay for that accomplishment, for that crown that they're working for. And he says they're doing it for a perishable crown. But we, for an imperishable crown, a crown that will never wear off, a crown that is eternal, a crown that is perfect. But the same dedication, the same commitment is required. Verse 26, therefore, in other words, because of the imperishable crown, we run thus, not with uncertainty, and thus we fight, not as one who beats the air, you see, if you can get your belief system right, if you can get your mind tuned in, your soul, with, this, with your spirit, and your spirit with the Word of God, and you can really and truly in your heart of hearts understand, I don't know how many Christians really believe that there's eternal life. I don't know how many Christians really believe that there's a life here after all of the reward. I don't know how many really believe that the things that are in the Bible are honestly, truly true. And I don't mean because of some tradition, because I'm a Christian, I have to accept what the Bible says. I mean, truly impacted in your heart that you have no doubt. The way that you believe that when you lay down your head and close your eyes, you're going to sleep. And the way that you believe that you'll wake from that sleep. 
The way that you believe when you're thirsty and you drink water, your thirst will be quenched. That kind of belief. Because if we really did, we will be focusing not on 70 years on earth, but on millions of year, years after. This will be a joke. This is boot camp. This is a training session. This is nothing. This is practicing. This is not the real McCoy. If we had that certainty, our whole attitude would change. Our whole flight would change. It will be different. We will press on with certainty. We will forget the things behind. We will go forward toward the goal. We will see that goal and say, that's where I'm going. I'm going to put blinkers on and I don't care what the world says in terms of temptation. I don't care what the world says in, ter in, in terms of comfort. I don't care what glory I can receive here because that price is so much greater. Think of a Moses. I mean, because of, of his stepmom, he became a prince of Egypt. But he was a good little Jew. He wasn't stupid. And he gave up all of that to go and take a grumpy bunch of people out of Egypt through a wilderness. Why? Because he with certainty knew what the end result was. And he focused on that and said, I'm giving up all this comfort, I'm giving up all this luxury, I'm giving up all this glory, all this honor, I'm giving it up because that is real. And I think sometimes with Christians it's not real enough. Are you with me? Let's have a minute and just have a look at what is behind us. Behind each and every life, depending on how old you are, yeah, there's quite a few people younger than I. Alright. But behind all of us, there are bad things. There are past failures, there are nasty experiences. And if you're a South African, you probably tasted more than most. Okay? And on these, we mold our present decisions. You see what I'm saying? I'm looking at my bad experience, I'm looking at my past failure, and I want to make a decision now, and I base it on that, don't I? If I do this, this may happen, and because of that past experience, that may happen, and we mold our decision around that. We build our confidence on that. When I try to start a business, I fail. So now I'm at the point of, what must I do to make a living? Start another business? Oh, well, yeah, I failed in the last. I think it was Abraham Lincoln that was bankrupt ten times. He became the state president of America. He certainly did not focus on past failures. And see what I'm saying? Forget the things behind you. Forget the past failures. Forget the bad experiences and you'll have your confidence restored. And that means even in terms of relationships. Some of us are so scared to be hurt by a relationship. Listen, I got news for you. You can look around you and every person in this building is going to disappoint you. I'm going to disappoint you. We're going to fail each other constantly. Because none of us have been perfection. Not even you. And because of that, we constantly, but we cannot focus on that. But it may say, okay, Robin, you failed me. So what? Yeah, brother, let's carry on. Yes, you, you also failed me. Let's carry on. We're not all unique. God has made us uniquely. We have different ways, different habits. I hate most of yours and you hate most of mine, but it doesn't matter. God has put us together and we've got to walk together. We can't focus on those things. You can't say, I will never marry again because the last husband or the last wife was a terrorist. And I'm not, I'm going to close on my heart, I will never love again because I, it hurt last time. Well then sit and be miserable for the rest of your life. Because that's just the way it works. Dad disappointed me, I'm never going to trust him anymore, I'm sorry. Next time he's not, but a month after he might disappoint you again. Because dad is as human as you are. Believe it or not. Are we still together? Behind us are also good things. And sometimes we want to focus on those. And like I said earlier, then we get wrapped up in false nostalgia. And we start thinking about the good old days. In my days, in the 60s, if you remember it, you weren't there. Okay? You were obviously not there. 
We were so high, brother, that if you remember the 60s, you weren't part of the 60s. <laughs> but there was something about the 60s and even the, the 70s in this country, for instance. You know, it was sunny skies and Chevrolet, wasn't it? Man, it was the land of milk and honey. Uh, Two dollars to one rand, no, to a mile. One dollar seventy-five to a rand. Yeah. Two rand to a pound. You could look at your boss and if you looked at your skin and said, listen, take your job, I'm going across the road and just walk into another the same day. Anybody remember that? Hmm? You didn't have burglar bars around everything, including your motor car windows. Yeah, you know I mean, we thought we had, we didn't appreciate it though. But now some people want to sit and focus on that. Everything was peaceful and the economy was great, and etc., etc. Et and both people are trying to focus on that and reminisce about the good old days. I am sorry. You're stuck in something you shouldn't be stuck in. You've got to press forward. You've got to reach forward. You've got to move on. You see, because we believe those days were better, we become bound by past circumstances and we are turned negatively toward the present and the future. And I listen to you, listen to me, parents today. If you're my age or a little younger and you've got teenage children, Stop telling them about those good old days. Alright? Don't tune them in negatively about, yeah, is there a future for our kids? Yes, there's a future. While there's a God, there's a future. And I tell you something, it was great. Many things that happened to this country was great. Because it shook a lot of people out of their apathy. If you see the people that really believe, the people that have some kind of integrity, the people that have some kind of courage, they have taken the bad situation and they're turning it into good. There are many business today that never would have went into business until they got the old golden answer. And they thank God for it today. But these are people that have not got stuck about the good old days. This is my situation, what I'm going to do about it, and they press forward to a future. There is a future. Forget the past and press toward the prize that awaits. Philippians 3 again, verses 7 and 8. Here what Paul says, and now we're talking the spiritual life again, we've got to talk eternity and life on this earth now. We've got to talk spiritual and physical. Eternal and temporal now. This is what he says. The things that were gained to me. In other words, the things which I thought I would profit by. The things that I thought were important to me. These I have counted loss for Christ. In other words, all, you know, you've got to look at Paul and understand Paul. You've got to see where he comes from. His father was a building contractor. Alright? In today's terms, he was a tent maker. People lived in tents. It was a thriving business in those days, his father. Paul was also a Roman citizen in spite of the fact that he was a Jew. And there was two ways you could become a Roman citizen. One, by your wealth, you could buy your way in. And the other is you became a soldier in the Roman army. There was no other way in if you're not born Roman. Okay. Paul was not a soldier in the Roman army. It must have been dad's wealth that brought him the citizenship. That's my conclusion. All right. This Paul was also in his day one of the most in intellectual people, a highly studied man. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was being groomed for the Sanhedrin. In terms of academic qualification, it was something between. Uh, uh, a minister, a reverend, a Germany, a pastor, sorry, they don't know the ones. Uh, something to that effect, and a solicitor or a lawyer. He knew the law, both the, the legal law, or the man's laws, and he knew God's laws. This was no little monkey, and he strived towards these things. He was there debating, 
every day. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. All right. And he's looking at all this position, all this importance, the fact that he was going to serve on the Sanhedrin. He looks at all of this and he says, I count all of that which once was gained as loss for Christ. All of that that I regarded so highly was nothing compared to having Christ. Verse 8 he says, he turns around, he gets a little harsh, becomes a bit like Steve, and he says, and I count them as rubbish in the latter part of verse 8. I count them as rubbish. Now guys, until we get to the point that we actually understand that all the things that living on the marina, driving the beef at Merck, holidays on the French Vieira, wherever you want to go, all of that is rubbish compared to the prize that awaits. Am I making sense to you? Unless you can see that they're rubbish compared to what awaits. You've not got it in your heart yet. And you've got to get it in there somehow. God give you the grace to get it in there. We've got to see, like Paul says, I, I regarded them all as so important, now I see them as rubbish, because there's a greater prize that awaits me than all of these things. If you really want to sit down for a minute, you know, I, 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 I'm one of those guys that can reminisce. And ask her, I'm a bit of a funny weirdo. I can be a bit romantic too. My wife didn't think I was until I took out a dictionary and showed her what romantic meant. Then she said, My husband, you're the greatest romantic in this world. Now, uh, romantic is not chocolates and flowers, ladies. Go take open the dictionaries and see what it's about. Okay? Now, I can reminisce, I can sit with you. Ooh, it was good, it was good. Man. If you read Acts 39 when I was young, you know? Uh, great stuff. I can sit and do that, but you know what? Most of the time when I really sit down and I look at DVDs and videos and photos and stuff that, that I've gathered from the 60s and the times when I was young and, and, I, and I listen to tapes and stuff and I really look at it and I, I look at myself and I'm like, oh Lord, and I thought I was, what do you guys call it? It's cool today, so it was hot then, but I thought, I thought it was hot and I, I was actually cool. Now you, in your turn, to really hot. I don't know. Anyhow, something. <laughs> but when I looked at that, I thought, you know, I, I took out a picture the other day, and my friend, uh, a friend of mine had, his father had race horses. And I thought the coolest thing I had, I had this like beige pants with green pinstripes down. Anybody can think that back. Can you remember that? And it's bell bottoms, like I swept the next block ahead of me. Um, and I had this thing on, and, 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 and his father had this. Uh, jockey shirt, you know what these jockey shirts are they're down here and they got all these fancy colors, almost like the shirt I got on this morning. It just was more multicolored. And I had this thing on my hair's down here and some little thing that had like a sweat bang and I look at myself and I figured it down in front of my mouth. I thought, that was cool! <laughs> God help me! I just looked at this and I thought, it was so great, but it was really rubbish. We thought it looked so good, but it was really lucky. Most of the stuff we did, and we really thought it was so wonderful, it wasn't so wonderful at all. It was all in the mind, it was all... And our values change, and we start focusing on other things that we then think is important. After that, I thought four-story home was great, and, and a Mercedes was, that was the thing. Man, that was it. That's what I worked for, that's what I lived for. Had no life, had no family, had no rest. Nothing. The, the one story became two, and the two became three, and the three was missing the fourth when eventually God woke me up and said, Where are you going? This is the Tower of Babel in Israel. <laughs> that was it. Oh, obsessed. This is good. This is all. This is living. It wasn't. It was dying. And suddenly you realize it's, it's, it's worthless. Now, Exodus 16, I'm sure you've got your Bibles there, verses 2 and 3. I just want to show you something. It says, then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. Yeah, God is taking them 
into the land of milk and honey. He's taken into the land of rest and peace. He's taken into the land of plenty. They're on this journey. And because the journey gets a bit tough, these guys sit and they long for the flesh pots of Egypt. They forget they were servants, they were slaves. They forget how they were worked day by day. How they had to fetch their own grass and make, cut their own grass and make, make a quota of bricks every day with grass and, and mud. And how they were beaten and badly treated and poor and suffering endlessly. They forget all of that because they get caught up with false nostalgia about the past. They lose sight of the prize which awaits them and they look at the dung of yesterday. And so often we as Christians do that. We start longing back for the stuff I had yesterday in the world because the, the going is getting a bit tough now. Okay? I want to make this statement. Life consists of leading an entry. And people have to get this in their minds. Please guys, don't get out of this one. You will be leaving your mother's womb in order to enter into learning how to eat and how to crawl and how to walk and how to speak. Do you know that it's actually a comfort for a baby in mom's womb? That's why they come out screaming. It's not because the doctors are ugly. Some doctors are ugly. Some, some babies are ugly. When a baby doesn't scream, they smack his body sometimes. When I was born, they smacked my mom. Alright. From that you will leave the comfort or the security of mommy and daddy at home so that we can enter into primary school. And it's quite dramatic that first day. I mean, for me it was. My, my first break, the teacher taped right around my head my mouth and she kept it there till the afternoon to cut the glues with the scissors. She says, there's no stopping this child. No one made their sounds feel like that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you understand? Quite dramatic. But it's leaving an entry. You leave primary school in, in order to enter high school. I remember when I entered, you know, when I was in primary school by Standard 5, played rugby right for the first team, Hey, was a great sprinter, was a tough boy in school, you know. I don't know about when you guys were at school, we used to have a competition at school. Who's the strongest boy in school? You know, and whenever a new boy came in, you had to fight him to show that you were the tough boy. Walking out of that, and all of a sudden I came into school and my schoolmates had more hair on their legs than my dad. <laughs> they had tougher beard than my uncles. Quite a traumatic experience. Walking there with a chip on my shoulder for two days. I got smacked from morning till night and all of a sudden decided, no, I give up. I'm among men now. But I had to leave in order to enter. And every leaving and every entering is, is a bit traumatic. Then I left high school by the time I reached the top and I was Mr. Big Shot again. I had to enter into varsity or in early employment for some of us. We had to enter into something else again, which was totally different again. That is life. You leave in order to enter. And eventually you leave your father's house to enter into marriage. Whew, and is that a new kettle of fish? Right? You're all starstruck and still you understand that she doesn't put toothpaste bits on. She wants the toilet seat down permanently. All these new things happen. All of a sudden you're going to tell where you're going and why you're going and when you're coming back. And say, Lord have mercy, what have I entered into? Yeah? And we leave the kingdom of darkness to, lead, to, to enter into the kingdom of light eventually in our lives. And again, the whole new set of rules, guys. You can't live by the rules of the kingdom of darkness once you've entered into the kingdom of light. You've got to change your belief system. And every time you leave, you must forget what's behind and focus what's ahead. Am I right? When I left primary school, I thought I had to forget a whole lot of things and say, right, now I must look at the tribulation. Now I must look at what lies ahead of me. I can't focus on that anymore. And so also mothers. Please, 
allow your 30 year old boys to leave. <laughs> Please, moms. They have to leave us to enter into lives of their own. This is the way of life. I know moms need it. Some fathers do. But this is the way of life. They have to leave to become their own individuals. They in fact leave to set up a whole new line of authority. Now that you guys have taken up the authority, you're not the heads of the home yet, but you'll get there someday. But they'll have your voice to become the new line of authority. I'm ending off. How you enter depends on how you leave. How you enter depends on how you leave. If you leave anything, your old work, your old house, your old church, whatever you leave, if you leave it in anger, if you leave it in poverty, if you leave it in bitterness, you're going to enter the next one with those things. It's going to be your baggage. The same sin, the same emotion, the same circumstances will go with you. You'll take that baggage. And that's why I say to young people, or people that break up in relationships, even if they're not so young, don't be in a hurry to get into the next relationship because the next guy or the next girl does not deserve the baggage you drag with you from the previous relationship. Get healed. Get it behind you. Put the past behind you. Your next boyfriend, husband, wife does not deserve to be judged by what the previous one did. Get rid of the baggage. It's the way you live. If you're going to leave, you come to church bitter and angry with me. You're going to take your bitterness and your anger to the full gospel or whatever church you're going to. And that pastor does not deserve your wrath because of what I've done. Sort me out in anger. Get rid of the baggage. Get rid of it. Don't go punish the next person. The same way with your employment. You are full of anger, full of bitterness into the next job. You're taking that rubbish with you. And you're going to critically look at that boss because of what the previous one did. Are we together? The things behind us must be forgotten when we leave. Or we will not enter by reaching forward to the things ahead. We will be dragging the rubbish. Or it will be dragging us back. You can't live into your full potential while you're stuck with all that baggage. We've got to leave it behind. Our past disappointments, our past failures, our past hurts, if not forgotten, will have us entering into the future with doubt, with fear, with insecurity, with mistrust, with anger, with bitterness. That's how we live into the future, unless we can severe the past. And leave it behind us totally, completely. Your argument you had with your husband this morning, it's time to cut it right now and leave it behind us. You can't leave church after eating and drinking condemnation on yourself and then still go and fight over lunch. Cut it. Leave it. It's finished. Because you're taking it into the future. And that's going to make your future happen. Forget the things behind. Reach forward to the things ahead. Hebrews 11 1 says, Now faith is. Now faith is. Doesn't say faith will be. Faith may be. Faith is. God is. The Word of God is. Faith is not yesterday. Faith is not tomorrow. Faith is now. Hope is future. Faith is present. Faith is now. Now faith is. Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. In other words, every burden, everything that weighs us down. Emotion, sin, circumstance that will weigh us down. Let us what? Let us lay it aside. 
and also the sin that we brought from the past, which so easily ensnares us. If you drag it with you and ensnares you, if you have given in to bitterness once and you can't severe that, you're going to get bitter again. If you've given in to anger once, you're going to give in to it again. It will easily ensnare you. It becomes your pet little sin, your pet little thing. Lay it aside. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Reaching toward the things ahead. Let us run with endurance. Listen, a race is not run sat in a rocking chair. You've got to endure. And let me tell you, the Christian race, you're going to have to endure. You can go to another church and they're going to tell you how wonderfully you're going to be blessed. And you don't have to do everything, just pay your tithe. And God will just pour out blessings and that's what you can do. But I can guarantee you it's not going to work. You might as well hear the truth. And the truth is you're going to have to endure. Verse 2. Looking up to Jesus. Remember who despised the shame of the cross and saw it as rubbish. For the joy. For the joy of what? Of the goal that was set before him. In other words, Jesus also looked at what was ahead. Okay? Jesus did not go and endure all that suffering because he enjoyed suffering. He was not a masochist. He saw that after that su suffering, he saw the purpose behind it. He saw what, would, what he would accomplish through it. He saw the reward. He saw Robin and Doreen and Marcel and Reno and Paul and Steve and all of us here this morning. He saw us grasped out of the kingdom of darkness, placed into the kingdom of life. He saw us saved. He saw us living victorious lives. He saw us having eternal life with God. He saw a crown for me. And because of all of that, he said, I will endure this. He saw what was ahead. He didn't endure the pain just because he loved it. Come on, later on, I love this baby. That wasn't his mindset. His mind says, this is painful, this is uncomfortable, this is terrible, I don't want it. Father, in fact, if you could have any other way, take this cup away from me. But if there's no other way, I'm going to endure it for the prize that lays ahead. I will finish this race, I will run this race with endurance. I will take what comes my way for the prize. And that's why I'm saying we've got to get in here so that we understand it, so that we can see the prize and it becomes a reality, so that what we endure, we endure for the prize. My last scripture verse, don't say praise God. Philippians 4 verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. Christian, hear me. Worry is a sin. Complaining is a sin. Golly, I am so tired of pastors and Christians that are nagging in my ears all day. Uh, 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 but nothing. Be anxious for nothing. That means do not be anxious about your family. That means do not be anxious about your finance, your motor car. That means do not be anxious about this country or the future thereof. Nothing means nothing. Next, nada. Comprehend. Hmm? Nothing is nothing. Even here is not nothing because here is oxygen and all sorts of stuff that I can't even see. Nothing means nothing. But in everything, in other words, in every circumstance, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. The future is in His hands. I'm anxious about nothing. My life is in His hands. I can forget the past. I can press forward toward the goal of the higher call of God in Christ Jesus. There's no need to be anxious. We should know where the future is. You see, if you've got a way through a kilometer of mud to get to where your house is, when you're tired and you want to go home, you're going to wade through the mud. You're going to endure the mud because you know what runs ahead. 
And we've got to know what lays ahead so we endure whatever life the devil and people can throw at us. Are we together? But we can't stop getting back into the past if we're reaching forward. It weighs us down. It's difficult to endure. You know when they, they uh, what do they call it when they do with racehorses? They put extra weights on them. Anybody know? Handicaps. There's the word. It's my, my, my golf, which is a handicap. They handicap a horse. And they put extra weight on him. Now, we don't need handicaps. We must lay every weight or every handicap aside. Otherwise, we will not be able to endure. That's what Paul just said to us. Lay aside every weight so that you can run the race with endurance. While you're handicapped and weighed down with things from the past, reaching forward to the great price and the other call of God in Christ Jesus becomes extremely difficult. It hinders us. Amen. This morning, I'm not going to make an altar call, but you're going to stand up and you're going to lay that down. In Jesus' name. Father God, we just thank you this morning for your word, for the truth of your word. We thank you this morning, Father, that we will come willingly unto your throne of grace right now. We thank you, Father, that we know that we need to be anxious about nothing. Because this morning, Father, we make a decision to do one thing, and that is to forget the things that are behind us so that we can reach forward. Father, we come this morning and we lay down every weight and every sin that so easily ensnares so that we are able to reach forward to the great prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And Father, we look at this life and the circumstances in it. We look at what it has to offer. And like Paul, we say that which was once gained, we now regard as loss for Christ. We regard it as rubbish, Lord, for the prize that awaits. Help us to focus, Father God, by the Holy Spirit, put this in men and women's hearts this morning. Reveal. Open their understanding so that we can willingly lay down every weight so that it becomes a reality to us what we have waiting for us. That crown, that glory, that imperishable crown. Help us, Lord, to walk and live this life with temperance, tuning finally our spiritual bodies, our spiritual minds, to win this race, to receive the promise. Help us to see the goal of life in Jesus' name. And as we leave this building, Father, I pray for the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is not like the world is, a peace that surpasses all our understanding, to become the portion of everyone here present, and so also the joy of the Lord. Let it be our strength throughout this week, through every circumstance, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.